Jake? Jake? Can you hear me, Jake? What did you do today, Jake? I went to the movies. We watched a scary one. It was so scary that I jumped out of my seat and spilled my popcorn everywhere. Did you do that, Jake? Were you there? Jake? Jake! Then I went to the arcade. I ate a bunch of pizza there. I got red tomato sauce all over my mouth and more red on my clothes. There were so many other kids there. And then there weren't. I love you, Jake. You know that, right? I love you. Open the cabinet, Jake. Come over here. Open the cabinet, Jake. Open it. Open it. Open it. Open the cabinet, Jake. Hello, Internet. Welcome to Game Theory, where today the theory is coming from you. That's right. Just because we're all still waiting for Security Breach to release doesn't mean that FNAF theorists out there have been twiddling their thumbs. In fact, the lack of a new game has prompted the community to go back and comb over all the pieces that were in place for us before. Pieces that we might have overlooked or missed the first time out. And it was this thorough re-review of the clues that prompted what may be the biggest fan theory to blow up in over a year. And that's saying a lot since 20. 2020 was full of us connecting massive pieces of this franchise's lore. I mean, with the help of Fazbear's Frights, throughout last year's videos, we managed to pinpoint the year of the missing children's incident as 1985. We solidly connected Foxy Bro to Michael Afton. We even concluded the high likelihood that two spirits are trapped inside Golden Freddy, not just one. Our vengeful spirit, Cassidy, as well as our Bite of 83 victim, the Crying Child. But uh, have you ever noticed that that kid doesn't have a name? I mean, it's been six years since he was introduced to into the franchise in FNAF 4, and we still don't have any hints as to what crying child's name might actually be when he's, you know, experiencing literally any other emotion. Wait, is that, is that crying child? But no, that's happy child, and that's angry child, and that's confused child, that's, um, apathetic child, that is passionate child. Nope, nope, not that one. Ooh, is that emotionally repressed child? Hashtag relatable there. But really, take a moment to think about that. We know the puppet's name, Charlie, and her father, Henry. We know that baby was originally Elizabeth Afton. Purple guy slash Springtrap is William Afton. Other purple guy is Michael Afton. There's the missing children's incident victims, Jeremy, Fritz, Susie, Gabriel, and Cassidy, the vengeful spirit, who is at least one of the things trapped inside Golden Freddy. I mean, there is a name for pretty much every single character in this franchise, except for this one kid. The one kid who, wouldn't you know, was also important enough to have the first on-screen death of the series. Feels like we should probably be able to solve this one by now, right? Like, we should probably have gotten a name for him somewhere along the line, or at the very least, the means by which to solve for his name. The pieces have got to be in place for us, right? Well, today might just be the day where we solve exactly that. One Freddit user named Wolfie1740Kingdom thinks that they've cracked the code to finally solve the final name of the FNAF mystery, to finally give the crying child, the bite of 83 victim, a proper idea. Identity. So break out your tambourines, theorists, because it's Morty time. It's a theory review. Leave your theories in the comments below. I'll pick my favorites in the next episode of Morty. Now, today's theory starts where all the best theories begin. Dabbing Chica. That's right, folks, we're back to the most important lore item in the whole franchise. Not any of the novels. Certainly not the games. Those are just afterthoughts at this point. Nope, it's back to the children's activity book, FNAF Survival Logbook. In a past FNAF theory, we had a huge revelation about how this thing works. Basically, there are three people present within this book. There's Mike, who's alive and always writes everything in red pen. There's Cassidy, who haunts the book and speaks in ghostly faded text, but there's a second spirit here, the crying child, who's forced to communicate by actually altering the words that are found in the book. The example that proves it is right here. Cassidy says, the party was for you, and the crying child responds on page 89 by altering the text of the book to read, it was for me. We know FNAF 4's party wasn't for Mike, and we know Cassidy wouldn't be saying this to themselves. As such, it must be crying child acknowledging what Cassidy has said. Same thing here on page 59, with Cassidy asking, what do you see? And Crying Child answering on page 109, I can't see. Again, altering the actual print of the logbook. So that alone was pretty huge, and it went a long way to supporting the theory that both Cassidy and Crying Child possess Golden Freddy. And that alone would be pretty awesome. But it still leaves a major part of this book unsolved. You see, on page 95, there's a loose thread that's never been tied up. One that has personally driven me crazy for years. It's a grid where you're 
told to draw an 8-bit foxy. Just another random activity in this children's workbook, right? Wrong! The grid is numbered, and you can see in faint print that you're supposed to put letters into the squares, with the first few already being put in. So in our quest to solve Golden Freddy's name years ago, we collected the page numbers where the phrase, my name appeared, we added them together per the instructions hidden in the book, and then we plugged those coordinates into the foxy alphabet grid to get the name Cassidy. Good game, everyone! Let's all treat ourselves to some orange slices and give ourselves a pat on the back for solving another piece of the lore. Except, that's not how it worked. You can imagine my surprise and confusion when the numbers got plugged into not the alphabet grid that was clearly being telegraphed to us, but rather, the word search. And apparently we were right to do that since Scott Cawthon himself confirmed in his FNAF movie announcement the critical role that a child named Cassidy plays within the lore. But all of this still means one thing. The alphabet grid is awkwardly left completely unused, despite it obviously needing to be used to solve one of the mysteries within this book. And that's where Wolfie 1740 stepped in. In the book, there's one Cassidy question that's left hanging. On page 31, Cassidy asks, do you remember your name? Uh, of course he does. He's the crying child, duh. Crying child Afton. His, uh, friends call him Bite Victim for short. Just rolls off the tongue. But seeing that the logbook had helped to solve for Cassidy's name, Wolfie suspected that it might also be helpful in solving this other name, using you guessed it, the Foxy Alphabet Grid. What Wolfie noticed was that the crying child specifically uses the night's four and five shift rating questionnaires to speak with Cassidy. For the first three nights, the section reads as follows. Overall, fulfillment, health, stress, purpose, hope, and existential dread. But on nights four and five, you have other things mixed in here. Like, I'm scared, and it was for me. So Wolfie reverse engineered things, taking bite victims' answers and matching them to the page numbers where Cassidy asks the question. To quote from Wolfie's own post, the first one is I can hear sounds. The page it's responding to is 75, which says, does he still talk to you? And one trend to notice is that all four pages have a piece of blood on it. Next is it was for me, which is responding to page 103's question of the party was for you. Third is I can't see, responding to page 59's what do you see, and last is I'm scared, which stumped me, so I went off of what I already had." End quote. He then fully filled out the foxy chart with the alphabet, and going in the order that bite victims' answers appear, he followed the grid code to find the following four letters. E. V. A. N. Evan. After six years, could it possibly be that Evan is the name of the crying child? I honestly, I'm not sure. Or at least I'm not convinced off of this alone. Don't get me wrong, I don't think that this is a bad theory at all. Quite the contrary, in fact. Anything that tries to figure out the true purpose of that stupid foxy grid is gonna get credit in my book. The problem here is the methodology. Throughout the book, Cassidy asks a lot of questions, but only four of them actually matter. Wolfie also points out the blood stains, but there are blood stains on a lot of the pages throughout this book, not just those four. And even then, an answer like, I can hear sound, to the question of, does he still talk to you, it feels just a bit off. It's not very precise. You know, it feels random, arbitrarily trying to fit pieces together in a book that has been crafted to be anything but arbitrary. I mean, the Cassidy Code alone required you to find six numbers, find a page that points to another page on what to do with those six numbers, and then translate all six of them into the word search. Multi-step puzzles like this have to be precise in order to work. And while the puzzle pieces in Wolfie's theory certainly fit, Fit, they fit a bit loosely, you know? I mean, even Wolfie admits that finding the last N was a bit of a stretch, and it forced him to break his own methodology. In fact, another Fredit user, Godzilla813105, tried to correct for that to find the N in a different way. One of the other lingering threads of the book is a series of tally marks written by Mike that never quite add up to anything. They're never used, or at least their true use has never been discovered, but again, similar to the Foxy Grid, they must mean something something, right? To quote from Godzilla's post, I realize that there's a magazine Foxy is holding on the first page of night one that has five three on it. When you add five and three, you get eight. Then I took every single tally mark set in the book and added them together. I got this from the idea of how the whole quiz thing at the end of the shift says tally up your score. Putting all of these together gets you 47. 
four seven on the Foxy grid gives you the letter N, end quote. Again, it sounds good on paper, and I love the attempt to make sense of it all, but the why of it just doesn't line up for me. Why add tally marks to this number on Foxy's magazine? How are those elements related? And why would they be connected to a completely different set of three numbers gotten from a completely different set of clues? Plus, the story just doesn't hold. Contrary to what Godzilla says in their post, there is no tally up your score at the end of those nightly surveys. Thus, the rationale just doesn't hold up. In short, it all feels like we're convinced that we have a solution to the problem, and we're trying to back our way into how to get there. This is classic confirmation bias, where, as you conduct research, you try and find sources to justify your belief, or you retrofit the data to fit the conclusion that you're looking for. And I should know about confirmation bias, because lots of our theories over the years play with that very concept. Mario is a villain, provided you ignore all the times that he saves the kingdom. You play as the king in Hollow Knight, as long as you squint really hard during this one cutscene that might disprove that. For me, theories like those are all about telling a story. Connecting dots that definitely exist within a game that flip your understanding of the plot, but also sometimes go against what is much more likely and probably much more intended by the developer. And the theories that I tend to focus on are the ones where you can connect a surprising number of dots, even if one or two tend to disprove it. They're just meant to be fun thought experiments, you know? I like playing with the lore of these worlds. But here with FNAF, we have to be really careful. While I love both of these posts, FNAF theories tend to be about trying to solve things, speaking things into the generally accepted canon, and as a result, the methods by which we come to conclusions require more scrutiny. And here, the methodology of arriving at the name Evan just doesn't hold up as well as I'd like. But that doesn't mean the name Evan doesn't hold up. Because here's the twist, friends. This isn't just coming from the logbook. Shortly after Christmas, the Fazbear Frights book series released its latest installment, Blackbird, and it contains what is to date the most moving story in this franchise. The Real Jake, short story number two, tells the tale of nine-year-old Jake, who's dying as a result of a tumor in his brain. With his mother prematurely passed away and his father overseas in the military, Jake is under constant care by the young Margie. But there's one other special person in Jake's life, a mysterious figure named Simon, who speaks to him at night from a small cabinet in his room. Quote, the first night Simon had talked to Jake, Simon had made it clear he would be in the cabinet until Jake got well enough to walk to the cabinet. When you can do that, I'll be here waiting for you. End quote. And while it seems like Simon should be a sinister force, since, you know, this is a FNAF book after all, it's actually an expression of love. Margie had created this small doll named Simon with a walkie-talkie inside of him that allows Jake's father to speak to his son, distorting his voice to make him sound younger. Simon, every night, insists that Jake speak about what the real Jake is doing, the one who isn't afflicted with cancer, the one who is outside playing with his friends. All of this was intended to give Jake hope, with Margie updating the doll every few nights with food stains and scrapes on his knees to reflect the adventures that the real Jake has been having. It's a beautifully sad story with some legitimate surprises that I'm actually not going to spoil here. But the reason I bring it up is that, strangely, it is the only one of the 18 Fazbear Fright stories so far that has no explicit connection to FNAF. At all. Zero. Every other story thus far has mentioned a Fazbear pizzeria, or connected back to a familiar animatronic in some way. This one doesn't. Yes, it does have some lore connection to the ongoing Stitch Wraith storyline, but the lack of anything FNAF stands out like a sore thumb when every other story thus far has connected back in some way, which is why the name of Jake's father stands out so strongly. Jake's father is named Evan, which alone is interesting, but becomes much more noteworthy when you consider that he has a brother named Michael, his only living family. And not only that, this is how Michael is described in the book. Quote, he's, well, he's a little different. He's intense about making money, and he's really good at it. Just the way he is can make him seem like he's not not human, so he's like a cyborg with bad programming, end quote. Hmm, two brothers, one named Michael who gets compared to a human robot hybrid? Where have I heard that one before? Father. It's me, Michael. And that's just the surface level stuff, friends. Looking deeper, this is a story about a father communicating with his son via walkie-talkie, just like we see in Sister Location. Heck, you see him communicating through the walkie-talkie that is in a plushie. In the real Jake, it's Simon the doll with a walkie-talkie inside of him. In the games, it's psychic friend Fredbear with a walkie-talkie. Both children suffer from a severe head wound, Jake with his brain tumor, and crying child with a bite of 83. In the story, Jake goes on to possess the Simon doll, only for him to then pass on 
on to the Stitch Wraith, sharing that endoskeleton with another soul named Andrew. In the games, could it be that our crying child dies in the hospital and goes on to possess psychic friend Fredbear, which then somehow gets him passed into the Golden Freddy suit, where he then shares it with another soul named Cassidy. And all of this is happening in a story that has no connection to FNAF, but very clearly has a connection to FNAF. I'm just saying that the absence makes it all the more conspicuous. In short, I'm not convinced that the FNAF survival logbook is solved or anything like that. Right now, I'm just not sure the methodology for arriving at a final name is really as solid as I'd like it to be to enter my personal headcanon. But strangely enough, the name Evan feels like we're onto something. It has some very compelling evidence to support it from the real Jake story. So at this point, I want to hear from you. Let me know. Are you sold on the crying child being Evan alongside his older brother Mike? Or is this yet another example of Scott trying to bury the lead a bit and confuse us by using the same name a bunch of times? Shoving Michael in a bunch of places where he doesn't belong. All I know is that I can't wait for the next book coming out in March. At this point, forget Security Breach. It's all about those sick book drops, my friends. Because let's be honest with ourselves. At this point, uncovering the lore of FNAF requires more reading than your typical JRPG. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. And hey, if you missed our first quest to solve the security logbook, that video is on screen right now. It, um, it properly conveys my frustration with the series. And if you're interested in joining us on our ongoing quest to solve all the mysteries of FNAF, make sure you bite that subscribe button. Your frontal lobe will thank you because let me tell you, the last time I told you I was stumped about a puzzle in the security logbook, less than a week later, Cassidy was solved. I wouldn't be surprised if something similar happened this time. In the meantime, my friends, I'll see you all next week.